so thanks for having me. I kind of feel like um, this is in some ways my home away from home. Um, I uh, yeah, just have a dear affection for Kyle and Heather and what God's done and is doing through them and this church. And um, I've, I grew up right across the street, came to know Jesus and was called to ministry in this very room. I think if I've preached here before and I've maybe shared that before, but I just I uh, love what God's doing here. Um, so uh, we are in, uh, are you guys feeling good? You ready for a, g- a good a good message this morning? Like, okay, how many of you would like, you'd be in favor of like turning back the clocks one hour like every night? Um, my guess is that might cause some problems. I don't know what they might be. Some of you probably already have a list of all those problems it might cause, but um, somebody gets to work on doing that because I'm like, whew, this is like, we're all loose and um, we're, we're ready to go. Um, so uh, we're in this series, it's uh, week three, we're talk- you guys are all, you've been talking about this title for the life of the world, and the basis of the series is what does it look like for us as people, uh, in particular God's people, to live in such a way that the world would flourish, that the world would have life, and so um, this morning uh, we're talking about work. Um, now, deep breath. Um, you know, uh, how many of you love to work? Uh, now, now he, here's, here's what I want to caution you to. Uh, when you think about work, uh, what I don't want you to do is automatically put it in a box of like a nine to five. Because some of you are like, I don't work, I can't work, I'm retired, I stay at home. Okay, so you're like, this isn't for me. Um, but, but it is absolutely for you because all of us have been equipped by God to do work in the world and in the context that he's placed us. Uh, the average person spends uh, about 90,000 hours at work, like in the, this is talking about in the workplace, uh, over their lifetime. So 30% of your uh, life is given to the workplace. Um, you know how they say, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? Well, supposedly, um, work is hard to fall in love with because the statistics say that 80% of people are unhappy with their job. And just basically do it for a paycheck. Some of you sit here this morning and you deeply resonate with that. Uh, Others of you, you're like, I can't wait for tomorrow. Um, There's so many things like, like, right? We we hate Mondays, right? Like, any of you excited about what what tomorrow holds? But we we love Fridays. It's why you know Wednesday is called Hump Day because it's like we're almost there. Thursday is like the unofficial beginning of the weekend because we're like there and does anything really get accomplished Thursday, Friday because all we can think about is the weekend. And then like when you go on a vacation, you're already, when you get back, you're already counting down the days till the next vacation, right? Because it's like, I don't want to work. I don't want to do anything. I just want to like sit and take in and enjoy. Um, the average person thinks about work and groans because work is work right? Most of the time, we'd rather not do it. I'll pass. I'm good. Give it to somebody else. Whether you're in the corporate world, a nine to five, in the service industry, education, real estate, work with automobiles, law enforcement, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, which I would argue, or stay-at-home dad, maybe, uh, I would argue was probably the hardest of any job there is. Um, so those that go to work and leave your wife at home and you come home um, and you're like, what'd you do today? Mm-hmm. Don't do that. I'm just going to save you. If any, any like new marrieds in here, new kid, just had a first kid, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, it's going to save you. Um, or even if you're retired, listen, here's the truth is we all have work to do. We've all been tasked by God to do good work. And here's the question that I want to get to the bottom of this morning, is what is the point of it all? What is the point of it all? Watch this quick intro video um, to intro our theme of work. What is the role of work in God's economy of all things? What's the point of it all? What if I told you this? God created you to work. You're like, that is a mean God right? Um, what, what if I told you that? God created you to work. You see, there's the, this opposing reality because when we think about our work, when we think about what we do, 
um, there's this opposing reality of the American dream versus like the dream and the mission of God in the world because the American dream says you do in such a way that gets for yourself or you can begin to build a life and build a life and, and get nicer and nicer and better and better and get a nicer house and a nicer car and you know clothe your kids nicer and it just gets better and better and you just feed yourself greater food and it's all for you. God's mission and God's dream in the world is that we would live and work in such a way that overflows for the benefit and the blessing of the world. And here's the crazy thing is, is we get the joy of that. So it's not like it's not for us. It's not like we don't find joy and satisfaction when we do the work God's called us to do. It's that when, it's, when, when it terminates on us, it's a dangerous road. But when it terminates on, it's about God and his work and his mission in the context that he's placed us, then we begin to see great things happening. God gives us different purposes. He gives us different things to, to do. He's created us to do things. Um, here's the truth is that work was designed prior to the fall. How many of you, when you think of work, you're like, gosh, Adam and Eve, if they wouldn't have blown it. We get to be, uh, live on vacation. Well, no. I want you to look at this passage in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. Here's what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Here's the truth. In the beginning, there was work. Did you know that? Um, one author, if, if you're interested in this concept of work, uh, just an incredible book by a guy named Tim Keller called Every Good Endeavor, Connecting Your Work to God's Work. Uh, in this book, listen, listen to this quote where he describes work. It says, in the beginning, God worked. Work was not a necessary evil that came into the picture later, something human beings were created to do, but that was beneath the great God himself. No, God worked for the sheer joy of it. Work could not have a more exalted inauguration. Here's the thing. God delighted in his work, right? Like He, he created and he steps back and he's like, It's good. Have you, have you ever done that? You ever, you ever did a job, worked hard on something, you step back and you're like, yes, I'm in the process of, of rehabbing a house. And we took this carport and we turned it into a garage. And, uh, and on Friday, we just put the siding on it. And I like, I step back and I'm just like, yeah, like that's, it looks, it's like, it's what I dreamed of. It's what I thought of. Like, it looks good. Like, listen, God delighted in his work. He found joy in what he did. But then he comes along and he commissions you and I to go and do good work in the world. He commissions us. He, he sends us. Listen to this. Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Listen, God's commissioning mankind to do work in the world, to oversee, to, to cultivate, to, to, to bear good fruit. In Jeremiah 29, this is a passage Kyle referenced last, year, or last, uh, last Sunday when he was talking about the origin of family to bring about the flourishment of society. Um, listen to these words. From the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the exiles who were not in their hometown. Because as Christians, we're not in our, this isn't our home. The Bible calls us exiles and foreigners. But what do you do as an exile and a foreigner? Build houses and live in them. It is a Christian thing to build a house and live in it. I thought the Christian thing was like just to like go to church. No. I keep reading. Plant gardens and eat their produce. That is a good and godly thing. But, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, 
and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Maybe you're sitting out there and you're like, man, how, how in the world can you get so excited about work? Like, Dave, like, seriously right now? Like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, you don't realize what I have to go to tomorrow? And some of you, I just kind of, kind of wrote down some scenarios. Maybe some of these will hit home. Uh, I sweep floors and wash dishes and clean up people's half-eaten food. Like, yay, like, that's what I get to go to tomorrow. You know, some of you are like, I, I log data in a spreadsheet all day. Woohoo! To the glory of God. I discipline kids and clean up their messes and make them lunch so they can complain that they didn't like it. Right? And then after you feed them, like, 20 minutes later, I'm hungry. I listen to customers yell and complain at me all day. It's exciting stuff, right? Or maybe you work for a terrible boss who's unrealistic and impossible to please. You're like, really? Like, we're supposed to get excited about work when some of these are some of the situations that we endure and some of them that we have to deal with? Here's the truth about our work is that we know that work has been affected by sin, right? Uh, we live in a fallen, broken world. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. It's exciting, right? Like, woohoo! Like, let's throw a party. You know, some, but some of you are like, I love to sweat. Like, I love to work hard. And some of you are like, uh uh, uh uh. But here's the truth is that our work. The things that God's entrusted us to do is hard and is difficult in many ways because it's tainted by sin. It's affected. It's broken by, by sin. But here's what we have to get back to. It's the old phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? Works hard. It's tainted by sin. There's struggles. But that doesn't mean it's not from God. And we don't just... Well, get rid of it. I, I just God's not intended me to work because it's difficult. Well, if we want to, if we want to go with that theory and play that out in every scenario, I don't think we'd do anything. Would anybody get married? Well, God must not want me to get married because it's difficult, right? I mean, like, no, don't remove what God's intended. God's dream. Here's God's dream for you and I regarding um, work: is that in our work we show the world what God is like by what we do and how we do it. Think about that. Like tomorrow, Monday, you're, you're waking up, you're, you're ta going into the task that God has for you, whether it's watching grandchildren, whether it's going to clock it in somewhere, uh, whatever it may be, you have an opportunity to show the world what God is like through the good work that you do. That's this idea for the life of the world that would cause the world to flourish. I, I want to kind of give you a, give you a glimpse of, of this because I think that in, in our lives, we, we dichotomize the Christian life from like everything else. And we think the Christian life is largely what we do here. Um, but I would argue that the Christian life is more so the reality of who we live out there. Okay? And so if we're to be people that see our work as God charged to go and be and do and show the world what God is like through our work, what does that do? It enables us to be hope-filled people in, in the work that we do, right? That we could begin to bring restoration to things that are broken. I mean, we could go around the room and talk all day about the broken situations that you have to deal with every day, right? But what does it look like for us to be people that are reminded, okay, God's given me a mission. God's given me a purpose to go and do good work to bring restoration and healing. I, I want to share an example with you. Um, so this past week, I became uh, aware of, a, of an organization uh, in East St. Louis called R3 uh, Development. And R3 Development, uh, basically, they're a youth employee. You can go look it up. They're doing phenomenal things. Um, they're a youth employment uh, a community development organization where they take kids from the charter school in East St. Louis and they employ them by rehabbing homes in East St. Louis. So they're teaching them trades and, and skills 
Um, also, there's classroom time, and they're rehabbing these homes and teaching these kids uh, how to do these things and how to have a job. Um, all the while, they're, they're also going to school. And they're developing these kids into leaders, but they're also restoring the community of East St. Louis. And so then, then they have... Then, then they try to sell or rent the unit, and they try to bring like bring somebody in, and then have a you know treat the, like be a good landlord and treat the whoever moves in there with dignity and hope. Okay, you see in that picture so many different scenarios that are causing society to flourish. Something that's broken down, something that's tainted by sin, something that's affected by the fall, and doing good things that God's equipped and God's given to change someone's life, and to change a community. Empower North County it is your tangible example here that many of you work in every single uh, week or all the time that you've devoted time and energy and money to that's making a profound impact here through the good work that God's doing through you all. Um, I, I, I want to point out a couple things as we, as we think through work. Here, here's the first one. Who you... Or what you do does not define who you are. So we're thinking about work. And so you, automatically your mind is going to, well, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. And if we're not careful where, where we get in danger in our work is that begins to, to take shape in our mind that that's who I am. Right? Um, oh, I'm just a bus driver. Right? Oh, I'm, I'm, I just clean up kids' poop. Okay. Um, and, but the truth of the matter is, is that what you do does not define who you are. There's a parable in uh, Matthew 25, it's a parable of the talents, um, and it depicts God when it says this, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his Ability. So God, he sees the abilities that we have and he entrusts, he entrusts us with, with gifts and talents and abilities to do the work that he wants you specifically to do in your context to change a life for the rest of time, but also that your life would be changed. Oftentimes we think that what we do defines who we are, right? We're not human doings, we're human beings. You ever meet someone, they're like, so what do you do? Next time you meet someone, don't ask them what they do. Say, so who are you? <laughs> they might run. You might want to have a little space between the two of you when you, when you ask that. Um, right? but, but we define who we are. We, we base our identity on what we do. Uh, if you don't believe me, um, quit your job and, and don't do what you do for a while and see how that affects you. Like, it's odd. It's an, some of you have been in transition. You've been in a, like, in a place of like, I don't know what's next. And you're like, who am I? I did this forever. Like, right? We, it's because we attach our identity to what we do, not to whose we are. Listen, you're a love child of God. You're a love child of God. Some of you just need to sit in that for a long time. And then maybe God would release you then to go live out the good work in and through your life. But some of your work oftentimes is marked by this overwhelming pressure to, to do, to perform, to live up to expectation that you can never live up to, which is why Jesus had to die, right? It's why Jesus says, it's finished. It's like when he hung on the cross, when he rose from the grave, when he conquered sin and death, what he did was he conquered everything you needed to be and everything you needed to do for all of time. And then what it means to live in the Christian life is actually then to step into not who you ought to be, not what the good thing you should do as a Christian, but who you already are in God's eyes. That's what the Christian life is. That's what our work is. Becoming in practice who you already are in God's eyes. Some of you are like, you're working, 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 working. God, Daddy, are you okay? Like, what do you think of this? Anybody have kids? And all the time they're like, Daddy, look. Daddy, look at what I did. 
They're craving, longing for affection, longing for affirmation. We're the same way. And God's like, you have it. Okay, right? It's like God doesn't love a future version of you. God's like, I love you when you stop. No, he's like, I love you because of who you are in Jesus. And it's finished. It's finished. Now go and be and do that in the world and live with that hope. And I'm accepted and I'm loved. And here's the crazy thing is that, that so often, back to this parable, we want to be five-talent people. Right? I mean, we look around the world and we compare and we're like, wow, look at the good work they're doing. Look at the good work they're doing. Look at the good. Can I just tell you, it's paralyzing. You will never do anything. You'll never do anything because you're constantly looking at what other people are doing and not living out the mission and work of, that God's entrusted for you to do with your life. It's paralyzing. And God's like, I created you to be a one talent person that's going to absolutely do unbelievable things in this one avenue, in this one venue. I didn't create you to do all this work that this person over here is doing. Can I just say it's freeing if you can say, okay, God, you're God. And I'm not, right? Because we make some pretty crummy gods. Um, raise your hand if you struggle to find fulfillment in your job. Maybe sometimes you, you can't step back and be like, yeah, like, look at what I did. Half the time you step back and you're like, like, what did I do? I don't even know. Like, I've spent all day here. I feel like it's worse off than it was when I started. Like, why did I come in? It's more of a mess. Right? Or like, I've come so far with my kids, I feel like today, like, we started over. Like, I thought we learned some things, and now we're just back to square one. Right? Or we re restore, rest restore, whatever it may be, and all of a sudden there's a fire. And pff, what was the point of it all? Maybe for you, uh, maybe you aren't living in God's, uh, God's intention for your life. Maybe you're not doing what God wants you to do. Maybe you're settling for the, the, the job and the work that brings affirmation and attention and maybe the higher pay uh, when God says, I want you to, I've gifted and wired you to do this, which maybe isn't seen and applauded by the world as much as this. You're not being who God's called you to be who he's gifted and wired you to be. Or maybe you're trying to live out that American dream where you're just like, man, just, just a little bit more money. Just like one more promotion. Just one more, you know, like bonus or award. Just sell one more property. Do one more perm or whatever you do. And you're just like, more, 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 more. And God's like, no. No. You aren't defined by what you do, but by whose you are. Later on in the parable, the master came back and said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Like he's like, Come experience my pleasure. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I want to look at a passage in Colossians chapter 3 related to work. Here's what it says. It says, Whatever you do, work heartedly as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Here's, here's the truth. The world needs a God-saturated work ethic. Is that you and I would be people who... Um, who God saturates what we do. Let me give you the, let me explain it by explaining the opposite. Okay, uh, here, here's what like a human saturated work ethic would be. Uh, underworking or laziness. Like you don't do anything. Like you sit around and you maybe do what you have to do to get by. Or what you know you won't get, um, you know, you'll, you'll do what you have to do to not get yelled at or in trouble. Listen, laziness diminishes the good work of God in the world diminishes God's plan. And here's the truth is someone else gets to participate and get the blessing and you miss out because you're sitting and you're not being and doing what God's entrusted you to do. Or, or there's overworking. 
Okay, anybody ever experienced burnout? Anybody ever like, I would work 24 hours a day if I could. You know what that diminishes? You know what that does to the idea of God, God and work? Is it fails to let God be the provider. And it fails to let God teach you that you can take your hands off of things and everything will be okay. But we want to like, I got to have my hand, got to have my hand in this or it's going to fall apart. Maybe, just maybe, you're not as good as you think you are. I know I'm a guest and I'm like, you're going to like not let me back after I say that. Um, <laughs> but we overwork. We never find the joy of the master because we never stop long enough to experience his pleasure. I'm not saying don't delight in what you do. Just don't let it define you. Just don't let it be all you do. Make time for play. But then there's also a self-focused reality of work where all we do is we focus on what we do and our part. You know, if it was only about the forester, you wouldn't be sitting in the seat you're sitting in. But the forester and the mill worker and whoever cut this stuff out and whoever made the fabric and sewed it into there, all of those individuals come together to bring about an incredible piece it gives you a soft, comfy seat to sit in this morning, right? It's not just about you. It's not just about what you do. You're a contribution to the good work of God in the world. Here's the crazy thing I want you to think about. Oftentimes you think about your boss. You think about, Ugh, my boss is overwhelming. Um, here's the truth about your work and what it looks like to live a God-saturated work life. God's your boss. Not your boss. Not your whoever you report to. Like God, like you report to the Lord. And He's the one that's giving you the charge and giving you the strength that ultimately you're accountable to. He's the one. And here's the crazy thing about God is, do you remember in the Old Testament, how was God depicted as a gardener? In the New Testament, how is God depicted in Jesus as a carpenter? Like God's a worker. God does work. And he's entrusting you to do that work. And what is God's work marked by? Relationship. How often do we get so into doing that we neglect the people around us? When what God has entrusted us to be and do as someone who our life is saturated by God in our work is it's relational because God is a relational a relational God but he, here's here's the last thing I want to mention is that I think as God's people one of the things that should mark our work is justice and virtue sorry two of the things that should mark our work are justice and virtue like they should ooze from who we are and what we do because we don't have to go very far to find bad workers. Like I've managed some of the restaurants for years. Bad workers are a dime a dozen, right? Is that the phrase? Did I say that right? I say that backwards. I don't even know. You know what I mean. All right. Um, they're so easy to find. Like no one wants to work hard. No one wants to do good work. Listen, as a, as a Christian, for those of you that are Christians here, here's the truth. You do what you do to establish good, the good work of the gospel and the good work of God's character in the world. Listen to how Amos puts it. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Hate evil, love good. What does it look like for you to go to work tomorrow and hate evil and love good? Think about that. I mean, stand against. You know, companies want to cut corners. They want to take advantage of people. They want to profile people. They want to be sexist. What is the gospel? How does the gospel inform who we are and what we do as we work? Right? God's a God of virtue. And God's a God of justice. And as God's people, whether you're dealing with raising kids or a dishonest boss or 
showing dig dignity to the elderly or a business that's shady or a, a business that's cutting corners. What, 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 is, what does Colossians say? Work for the Lord, not for men, right? Work for, work for, he's your boss. He's the one we do good for. I mean, how many of you, we could go around the room and I could say, name a business that's like not on the Better Business Bureau. I mean, you could probably name three. Because they're everywhere. And what is the role of God's people in the world? Is that we'd be the change. Not that we'd like review them. Right? Like, this business. No, you go out and you be the change that you want to see in the world. You go out and you do the work of the gospel in a world that needs virtuous people and people of justice and fairness in, in, in their work that are teaching honesty, that are being honest with how you handle money, that are being honest with how you handle customers, that are being honest and fair with how you handle kids. I mentioned the organization R3 Development. And I just want to kind of come back and share something about that organization. One of the things that they do when they finish renovating a home with youth from East St. Louis that they've employed, they put a family in there. Uh, a lot of times they try to put a Christian family in there. Um, they call those homes lighthouses. Every home that they've rehabbed, they call them lighthouses. You know why? Yeah. Because now that place is a light in the community, a light of transformation in the community. Listen, that's who you are in the work that you do. Is you're a lighthouse. You're somebody that can step into a space and you exude hope. It doesn't mean you always have it together, right? Like you don't have to. Like God's got it all together. It doesn't mean you know all the answers. No, but here's what you know. You know the God who knows all the answers. You know the God who is in control. And so when you step into the space that God's entrusted to you, here's what I want you to hear. Don't underestimate the impact of doing the right thing. Don't do it. Don't underestimate that. Oftentimes we're like, faithful, good, right, like, I'm done. No, do Keep going. This is what the world needs. This is where transformation happens. I was having a conversation with my son. He said, you know what, Dad? It's a lot harder to tell the truth than it is to lie. I was like, wow. Yeah. Brilliant. If it's the easy thing to do, it's probably not the right thing to do oftentimes. And how amazing is it that as God's people, we're commissioned to go and to step into the space for the work that he's entrusted to us to to be God, to exude God, to tell the world what God is like through the work that we do. I love this quote by a theologian. This theologian, he says, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of, human, of, your, of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And you know what he does to cry mine? Is he sends you and I into every sphere of society to be people of hope and people of transformation in the good work that we do to tell the world what God is like through what we do. It's powerful. It's powerful. Um, I want to ask Jeff to come back up. Um, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up. And, um, but I, I, just, I want you to think through what's tomorrow hold? What is the work that God has for you tomorrow. Think about it. I just want you to picture it. I know some of you are like nightmares, right? Um, I, I just, I, I literally, I want you to picture what you're doing tomorrow. Not today. I want you to picture what you're doing tomorrow. Where are you going to be? Who's going to be there? What are you going to be doing? Now, how can you Live and work in a way tomorrow that exudes the nature of God. Think about that. 
And who needs to be loved? Who needs just to be heard? Who needs a chance? What kid do you need to sit with on the floor instead of yelling at them to clean up and just play with them? Because as God's people, that's who we're called to be. That through the work that we do, we tell the world what God what God is like. We're going to sing uh, just a, one last chorus which as a reminder and as kind of like a send off. Um, I want to pray before we do that. God, I thank you for The reality that we are entrusted with work and with a task by you. you got to know there's people in here that they don't find purpose in what they do. They're struggling to even think about what tomorrow holds. And God, I pray that you'd meet them where they're at. God, I pray that you would entrust to them the reality that, that there's something bigger to live for. There's something bigger to be about, even in a hard workplace or a hard uh, project or whatever they're facing. God, what a brilliant plan you have. God, I, just in this moment, I just worship you that you would be amazing and loving enough to not just wipe us off the planet, but to actually save us and entrust to us the work that we do. So God, I pray that you would, you would just minister to our hearts and lead us as we process through what it means to be people who live for the life of the world, that we'd be changed, that the world be changed through who we are and what we do. In Christ's name, amen.